the concept of strategy is, is vitally important for any movement that hopes to affect meaningful change. As Rothbard wrote in Ethics of Liberty, the elaboration of a systematic theory of liberty has been rare enough, but exposition of a theory of strategy has, has been virtually non-existent. Indeed, not only for liberty, uh, strategy toward reaching any sort of desired social goal has been generally held to be as kind of a, a, cat, a catch as you can, a matter of hit or miss uh, experimentation or of trial and error. Yet if philosophy can set down any theoretical guidelines for a strategy of liberty, it is certainly its responsibility to search for them. But the reader should be aware we are, are kind of in uncharted territory. So since then, um, there hasn't really been too much progress made, perhaps until now. Um, to discuss the topic of what libertarians should do, I'll hand over to Jeffrey Tucker. Thank you so much, and thank you again for inviting me to this conference. You know what a pleasure it is to be invited for four separate talks. I mean, it's just a great thing. You don't have to economize on your thoughts at all. You can just stretch it all out as long as you want to. You know, it's just... It's just great. So that's been a lot of fun for me. You know, this whole uh, conference has had the strangest effect on me. I find that I'm ever more against the government. <laughs> I don't know what to think about that, really. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about, like, how to make this topic special. You know, I mean, how can I make this last few minutes we have together? mean something to you and to me. And I thought maybe I would just do something that I've not done since 18 years ago. Uh, when Murray Rothbard died, I've never actually talked about my relationship with him. So I think I'll do that. And is it okay? Let's talk about my friendship with Murray. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as I say, I haven't really practiced this, so I don't really know everything I'm going to say, but I met him in 1985. Look, he had a huge influence on the way I, was, I, I looked and understood the world, because I think before I met him, I think I might have had something of a, something of a, of a dark outlook. You know, this happens to libertarians. You know, you discover the ideal of human liberty. And you think, well, we should be free. Born free is free as, you know, whatever. And then you look at uh, the world and you think, well, hell, you know, the government's everywhere, ruining everything. And it's sort of depressing, you know, you just go to bed depressed, you wake up depressed, oh, the damn government's running everything again. And, uh, so it's just a miserable thing. And, you know, you, get, you stay this way. Um, if you join the Google uh, libertarian community, you know, uh, you know, on the Google Plus or something, you just read like 10,000 items of bad news, you know, like every second. Here's a guy being built, beat by the cops, you know, taxes are going up, you know, just horrible things happening. So, so I was sort of down in the dumps, and then you get despairing, you know, sort of think, well, you know, things are only going to get worse, you know. And you tell everybody, you know, it's only going to get worse, you know. That's your main message to the world, you know. <laughs> Join me in libertarianism. You stay down in the dumps, you know, just constantly, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but, you know, a funny thing is that... Um, when I first met Mary at Murray, uh, and I had read him, you know, I, I, I actually had gone to, uh, the reason I ever even knew the name Murray Rothbard, uh, the reason I was drawn to him is I was in the office of a, uh, of, uh, uh, a professor of economics, was he, was he economics, yeah, I think he was a professor, no, he, was more, he had a p position of something like, like political philosophy, I think, it was really, he was a political philosophy professor, and I was in his office, and we were talking about various things to read, you know, recommending Machiavelli or whatever, Plato. And I said, what's this book? And it was this big blue book, and it, it had the words man, economy, and state. I was interested in all three of these topics, right? So man, economy, and state. I said, well, you know, who's this by? He said, oh, this is by this guy named Murray Rothbard. Don't read him. He's an anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, that's all an undergrad needs to hear, right? <laughs> OK, I'll make a note of that, professor. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> First thing I did, you know, I read it. So I was really fired up about Murray. He seemed like a very stern and serious intellectual, you know, sort of rapid fire dogma, you know, from beginning to end, knowing all things. And when I met him, I was just astonished. He was a, a very short man and, uh, like, had an out of control a sort of laugh and joy. I mean, that was just, I mean, he was laughing all the time, like at everything. He was amused by practically everything that happened all the time. And um, a little awkward spatially, you know, he couldn't really find his way very well. 
and they always needed people to sort of take him here and take him there. I think it was mainly because he didn't want to bother with things like space and time. He was, he was more interested in ideas. And, uh, but, so, um, so I met him in 1985 and was taking good friends with him for the next 10 years. You know, he was, he was, the funny thing about being around Murray is that you, why do you want to be around Mur Murray Rothbard, right? You want, you want to be around him so you can learn from him, right? But it's actually very difficult to get him to teach you things because um, he was so anxious to learn from you. He was, he was like an information extraction machine, you know? So whatever you knew, he wanted to know that. Right? Whatever the subject is, basketball, soap operas, you know, uh, popular movies, uh, uh, you know, econometrics, uh, you know, the history of uh, uh, you know, the pr pr Protestant, you know, Protestant upheavals in 16th century England, you know, whatever, whatever the thing is that you happen to know about, he would get that information from you. And then uh, he would be disappointed when you would run out, actually. Uh, so that's all you, that's all, so that's it? That's all you know? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's it. I remember one time I was in, D in Denny's restaurant with him, and he was trying to extract from me some theory I didn't really have, but I pretended briefly to have it just because he wanted it so badly. Um, <laughs> so he was trying to figure out like why the East is so shabby. He says, Jeffrey, why is the East so shabby? And I said, I don't really, I don't know, Murray. Well, he says it hasn't really grown economically, it hasn't really grown culturally like the West. So why is that? I said, well, I can't say for sure, Murray. And he said, well, do you think it has anything to do with filioque? Now, filioque is a Latin word for, uh, that appears in the Christian creed, meaning that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son uh, uh, and not just from the Father. So this is a very obscure point, right? He says, do you think it has anything to do with the East's rejection of the filioque clause? Now, Murray was Jewish, um, so he didn't believe a word of this nonsense, but, um, but he wanted to know if maybe the rejection of filioque clause in the creed is the only difference between the East and the West, as far as he could tell, in terms of their overall confession. So he said, do you think I had anything to do with it? And I, I sort of quickly made up a theory, um, something to do with like um, some doubts about the incarnation and therefore, you know, a rejection of the, the, the material world and, its, and the blessings it can confer, confer on our spiritual lives. And he thought about it a while and he said, well, I'm not quite persuaded by that. Do you have any other theories? I said, Mary, I, that's it. I mean, that's the full extent of my knowledge about the filioque <laughs> question. I'm really sorry, you know. But this is the way he would always, he would get every bit of information you had on any topic you, you had. He was, he was always trying to learn from you. And so he would always listen to everyone. He was, he was very interested in everyone, um, every walk of life. Um, the other thing about Murray I read, and these are all lessons I, I sort of take from him. Um, the other thing about Murray is that he would read everything, and he would read it very quickly. And he was, uh, feared nothing. He was absolutely fearless intellectual in a way. He wasn't like... Um, a lot of people might think of him as being as like so strictly doctrinaire that he would only read things that like he would agree with or something like that. No, not at all. He was very anxious to read everything in the whole libraries he could get his, his hands on uh, in, in every field, history and philosophy and economics from every point of view. All he cared about is that the writer was smart, uh, honest, um, accurate. Then that was the book he would read. And he read just mightily fast. It was just extraordinary. I remember leaving him uh, we went to the bookstore together, and uh, I said, well, Murray, let me uh, go get the car. So I left him on a, on a bench uh, to read, you know, for a few minutes. I just walked to the parking lot, like, just right around the corner, got the car, came back and picked him up. Like, he wasn't about to walk to the car with me. Um, it was just sort of not his way. Um, and b by the time I came back, he came into the car, and I, I just looked at what he had done. He had uh, marked through thoroughly one book and got about a third through the way through the second book. And just a short amount of time. So, like, none of us mere mortals can possibly do this. But this is the way Murray read. He just read everything uh, constantly, and it was just mind-boggling how quickly he could, he could um, um, absorb information. Um, you know, and I think one of the reasons he was so good and so smart and such a... Uh, mighty intellectual force was precisely the joy he took towards life. He couldn't stop laughing. He always had this ebullient um, outlook, you know? And um, it was a little bit of a mystery to me, like how, uh, you know, an anarchist living in the age of Leviathan could have such a bright outlook on, on life. And I, I finally concluded after being around him for so long, essentially what Murray did was that he observed the anarchism in everyone and in everything 
and in everywhere he was. In other words, he didn't really believe that the state was in control of anyone, really, ultimately, or anything, ultimately. When he looked at the world, he saw anarchy at work. Like, anything beautiful was a result of free interaction of people. Any really creative thought was not implanted by the state or a policeman. It was something that was generated by the individual. Um, any beautiful hum human association of those things that people chose together, nobody forced together is really happy with each other. So if you saw beautiful things emerging, it's a consequence of free choice. So he observed a world in which anarchism was all around him. So he, 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 he had his worldview confirmed in, in everything he saw. And he filled himself with uh, and surrounded himself by joyful things. This is why he loved movies. He loved popular culture. He loved soap operas. He loved sports. And he really just loved everything that reminded him of the free agency of people. And he would naturally assume that everyone is an anarchist uh, all around him all the time. In fact, for years I knew him when I wasn't really an anarchist and I was always slightly afraid to tell him. Just like people are afraid to tell me today. <laughs> I'm not an anarchist, Jeffrey. What? Um, so I know, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, so I, I was hanging on to this myth of the minimal state, you know, for years with him. Until one day I just asked myself the question, is there anything the government can do that needs to be done, that the market can't do better? And I finally concluded that the answer was no. And I was pretty certain that in thinking this, I was on very dangerous territory of some sort, like lightning would strike me, or I was going off a cliff, or there's, I was at the point of no return, or something like that. I wasn't quite sure, but I couldn't quite dig myself out of this, this anarchist uh, um, trap I'd found myself in. Um, so I went up to him. I was very fortunate in some way. It's like you know, having to, it's like, you know, like if you become a Catholic, you know, ideally you want to be able to tell the Pope first, right? So, um, uh, so I was able to, I was able to tell Murray Rothbard that I had become an anarchist, you know, before I told anybody else. <laughs> and he was just beside himself because it startled me. You know, you think he'd say, well, that's fine. I didn't know you weren't one or something like that. No, he just jumped up, you know, and uh, just lunged at me with his hand, you know, and shook my hand uh, with both hands, actually, and said, congratulations, Jeffrey, I'm so happy to hear this. This is great news. <laughs> I just sort of pumped my arm up and down, you know, <laughs> just so thrilled. And so why would he be so happy that I had become an anarchist? I mean, what is that even really? Was it like some sort of religious thing? Am I going to heaven now? No, it's not that. So I think for Murray, to become an anarchist was, uh, was all about letting go of myths. It was seeing the world clearly and accurately for the first time. So that you, didn't, you weren't hanging on to this strange thing that's clouded men's minds for hundreds of years. This myth that if we just give a bunch of people a monopoly on aggressive force, um, that they're going to somehow improve our lives. And uh, realizing that that's not true is a, tr is a tremendously liberating thing. It also stops us from wasting our time and our lives trying to fix up the government, right? Which is a tremendous, you know, squandering of energy um, on the part of the human family that we all have engaged in at one point in our lives. So Murray was happy for me because I could see things clearly for the start, first time, maybe and uh, that I would not waste the rest of my life doing stupid things, you know. And so I think he was probably happy about that. That's why I was happy as an anarchist. The other thing about Murray, and there are many stories I could tell, but, you know, it's funny how things stand out in our minds, you know. Um, like, we remember the times uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I knew I couldn't get through this. Uh, so, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to have to move on to my next subject. Okay, the problem of despair. So Murray always avoided despair. He was never a despairing person, and he was always believed in hope more than anything else. Um, and he got angry at me one time. I was taking a class on uh, public choice economics. And in public choice economics, you learn that in democracy, it's just a rigged game. 
You know, there's really no way out um, because the costs are all uh, very diffuse among the population and the benefits of statism are very concentrated among a small group of people. So uh, the whole public is constantly being bamboozled and the people who are robbing us, you know, are, are winning so much, so willing to lobby forever to get these benefits. So the whole system is locked down. There's no chance for revolution. That's basically the core message of public choice economics. And I went up to Murray, I was taking this class like every jerk graduate student tends to do. They go up to their elders and, and spout off their wisdom, right? Um, and uh, maniacally and obsessively. So I went up to Murray and I said, you know, this is, this is what public choice economics thinks about this. And he said, well, I think that's ridiculous. So, you know, that, you know, if that's true, there would be no revolution anywhere, any time in history. And um, so, um, so I said, no, Murray, I don't think you understand. You know, I went through the logic again. I went through it like two or three times. And finally, he just got absolutely annoyed at me. He said, you know, if you don't stop this and stop spreading this despair, I'm going to be very upset with you, actually, because it's completely false. And it's contrary to everything uh, that human liberty is about. If, any, if people never had hope, that we would have no liberty at, at whatsoever, ever, in all of human history. We've been around some 50,000 years. Most of it's been pretty damn miserable, except for the last few hundred. And that's only because a handful of people believed in the possibility of human liberty, and they made it happen. We can do it again. That's what he said to me. And I walked away thinking, well, but he's not in the same class I am, so he doesn't really get it, does he? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? He was absolutely right about that. And I look back at that, you know, with, as you can see, some emotion. But um, uh, so he never gave in to despair. So let me just recap the lessons that I've learned from, from being around Murray all those years. One is to read everything, never be afraid of anything, never be afraid of any thinker or any writing. Um, we love the Austrians, right? But we don't want to get stuck in them. You know, sometimes uh, when I was worked at the Mises Institute, people come up to me and say, well, I've read all the works of Manger, Rothbard, Mises, Hayek, um, and only two have been Barbaric. I have two more to go. What do you think I should read those two next? And I would always think, well, maybe you should, you know, broaden your perspective <laughs> just a little bit and read other people as well. Uh, you know, it's a good thing sometimes. You know, we need to disrupt our own minds. Um, you know, just like status need to read the anarchists, I think we read, need to read the status uh, too. So Murray read everything I think we should too. We should listen to everyone. We should never dismiss any critic, ever. A lot of times, our most firm critics, the people who drive us crazy, um, are our benefactors. You know why? Because they help us think through problems. And uh, we shouldn't dismiss them with, by spitting or name calling or anything else, like I did this morning on Facebook to one of my critics. Uh, no, don't do that. <laughs> we should take everyone seriously and realize that our critics tend to uh, hammer on our weakest points, right? So we can learn from them and um, address them. Uh, the other thing we can do with idiots is try to find... <laughs> try, try to find the thing that they're saying that might be slightly true. And a lot of times they do say things that are just slightly true and praise them for that one little truth, right? And that works. It actually works. Um, you take somebody... Uh, you know, it turns out, I think Murray was right, that everyone is in his or her heart an anarchist, uh, just waiting to come out. It just has to be explained to them just slightly. Um, so find that part of a person who believes in human freedom, uh, extract that, uphold that, and praise them to the skies for that feature of their thinking, and work from there. That's the best way to get converse, in my view. That's the way Murray always worked. He would find the, the thing in everyone who, that believed in freedom and concentrate on that and work from there. And it works. That's a good way to deal with other people. You might learn something, and they might learn something uh, too. Um, Murray extracted information from every source. I think we should do that too. We should be learners, not just teachers. Uh, we should assume that everyone around us is basically a, a, a lover of freedom until they just drive us utterly nuts and prove that that is just the most implausible assumption ever. And we should never give in to despair. Um, now, I say this because... Um, so libertarians have a number of, of problems facing us. One is the problem of bad news, right? We just like to constantly focus on the terrible things the government is doing to us, especially since the media and nobody else seems to want to talk about it. So we tend to focus on it. There's another reason for libertarian despair, namely that we want so badly 
to fix a system that we don't control. This is a problem for us. So, um, and it took me like 25 years to realize this, so I hope I'm not shocking you with this announcement here. Uh, sort of God led me into this insight slowly so I could deal with it. I'm just giving it to you all in one, you know, sort of full presentation here, so prepare yourself. Um, but there's nothing you and I can do to change the government, because the government doesn't care what you and I think. Um, it's a little bit like um, if you've ever stood across the street looking at your, your neighbor's house and you hate that planter he's got on his porch and you really want him to change it. And so you just sit there thinking, I want him to change that planter. I hate that damn thing. I hate that thing so much. And like every day you do this, you know, you just wake up and just stand there looking at that planter, hating on it, you know, and you go to bed doing the same thing and you tell your friends about it and so on and so on. And it goes on like this for like 40 years and then you die. Um, <laughs> this is not a good way to live your life. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so, you know, we have to remember there's nothing we can do about the state. You know, I hate to say it, but there's not, nothing that you and I can directly do about the state itself, really. Um, democracy sometimes leads us to believe there are things we can do by electing this guy or electing that guy, and that's a nice diversion. That's a little bit of nice attention. And I don't want to put down people who put their, put their time into politics, and I think it's really, for some people, politics is a great consumption good, and that's fine. Um, really, I, I really do mean that. In fact, I, I, part of me actually um, admires people who are dedicated to politics um, and in a sort of professional sense. Um, they take the job seriously and dedicate their lives to it, and sometimes they can make little, little bits of progress here and there. Uh, but I do think we need to be realistic about it and not believe that we can bring three, freedom through politics. I don't believe that we can really do that. I think under the best even the best, most optimistic scenario, the most that politics could ever do is perhaps redirect the energy of the state away from less bad ends to, to from great, from from worse ends to less bad ends, maybe. Uh, perhaps slow down uh, the growth in some areas, redirect some spending here and there. You know, maybe some some changes in regulations. You know, marginal changes at the margin. But a true revolution for freedom is not really going to come from politics. In fact, politics is often just like academia, a kind of. Um, a follow-up indicator to other forces in life itself. It's a, uh, a projection of things that are taking place in under, underneath underlying uh, cultural and social and economic sense. I mean, pol politics is not a leader in society. In many ways, it's a follower. So uh, focusing all your energy on, on politics is, is often a mistake because you're just focusing on the wrong end. A uh, more fundamental thing are, are, are things like economics and, and cultural change and education. That's my own view on this. Another terrible thing that we tend to do as libertarians, once we discover that we can't control the government, so there's nothing we can really do about the state, is that uh, we do the next best thing, since the government's not listening to us, we attack our friends and our family. <laughs> That's always a helpful thing, really, you know. Because our friends and our family, they don't seem to agree with us, you know, and this is a problem. It means that they're part of the problem, you know. <laughs> so, so we ruin every holiday meal, you know, uh, with pronouncements, you know, on war and civil liberties. And uh, no, I've I've ruined many meals. You know, it's it's a lot of fun. a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. I remember, I remember talking to my, my grandparents and my, my uncle and my, my cousins and my, my brother and, and my, my parents and everybody around the Thanksgiving table about all the uh, grim murders that the U.S. had funded in Nicaragua through death squads. You know, the democracy works. It thrives on causing each of us to hate each other as much as possible, uh, especially, um, especially people who are slightly different from us, right? So, this is a terrible temptation that we fall into, I think, um, living in our, in our times. And what it does is, it, it leads us away from realizing what the true enemy is. Uh, the true enemy is the state. It's not each other. Um, and if we really want to fight back against the natures of the modern state, the best thing to do is stop hating on each other and, stop, and start focusing on what we all have in common, which is the love of human liberty, and start focusing on the real problem, which is the state itself. 
Um, and Murray was a good example of this too. Um, he fought against the, uh, uh, against the despair, the darkness and stasis of government by being hopeful and by uh, being progressive and always learning. Um, and he fought against the, t the tendency of the state to divide us and conquer us by always finding new friends, new allies. Uh, always his, his slogan was always to, to, um, to add and multiply, never subtract and divide. And that was, that was Murray's way. I believe we can do that in our, own, in our own life. So I've already said a few words about the political model and why I don't think that that is the ideal thing, although I don't want to put down people who do pursue that as a vocation. I think it's you know, somewhat legitimate in our time. What about the purely educational model, the idea of just putting ideas out there? And I think, I, you know, I spent many years doing this, and I, I believe in this. Uh, what we're doing at this seminar, I think it's a great thing. Uh, it's an essential precondition. Um, in fact, I don't believe that we can really ultimately achieve uh, our goal of bringing human liberty to the world without this essential educational step. Um, and essentially, the libertarian world has been in this educational mode for 50 years and has done uh, great work. You know, started with Foundation for Economic Education with Leonard Reed and it's continued with many nonprofits, uh, thousands and thousands of books and, and it, can't, it can't take place without that. But I think there are other elements we could add to the purely educational model. Uh, one of them is uh, a social model like the Students for Liberty is doing, and also Liberty on the Rocks, which I really missed uh, going to Friday night. I'm just going to grumble about that one more time. Um, I really wanted to be there, so I'm so sorry. But, you know, I like the idea that the liberty-minded movement is another phrase. I really like this, this phrase, liberty-minded. It's very good. Libertarians are a little bit awkward. Anarchists are some alarming to people for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so I like the phrase liberty-minded. I like this, this, this furthering of social groups because really that's what it's all about. In the end, it's about friendship and that's what liberty is about. It's about friendship and love and sharing and communication and getting along with other people. And it's ridiculous that we went so many years without any institutions furthering this sort of social model of uh, uh, social combined with education. I think it's an essential element. Um, but I think ultimately in the end, what we need to work towards is what I would call living a revolutionary life of beautiful anarchy. Uh, and to me, to me, this is what it's all about. And a revolutionary life doesn't have to uh, be like Jack Reed in moving to Russia to observe and cheer on the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, it, it, can, it can be about being a really great mom. It can be about uh, being uh, the best dentist, about being a wonderful entrepreneur, uh, an educator, um, you know, a, a, a cheer on of your, your children as they open their newest businesses, whatever. You can find uh, liberty and entrepreneurship in every area of life and there's no, no aspect of your own life that you can't infuse in some way with a revolutionary entrepreneurial uh, spirit. Um, and I've been thinking about this more and more and you know that I'm very interested in software and let me see how much time I have left. It's 510. We have how much time? How much? Like 10 minutes? Okay, so, um, so I'm going to say a lot of things that are very confusing to you now. Um, I hope it's not entirely confusing, but I'm very interested in software and I'm very intrigued at the software models that have come about and they've come about over the course of like 15 years because they're good. And they're good because they work. And they work because they're most compatible with what we want and because they function extremely well. So there are five marks to really great software. And by the way, Bitcoin has all five of these marks. So I'm going to list the five marks and then compare them to features of our own life that we can adopt. Sound fair? I mean, that sounds like a lot of stuff, right? So I hope it just, just doesn't blow your mind here. It's too much technical stuff, but I'm going to list them. One is the great software protocol works peer to peer. Like Bitcoin, you change one one person to another. And liberty is the same way. Remember that when you're spreading the ideas of liberty and that you're working towards the, the, the goal of liberty, we are always communicating one-on-one, person-to-person. You must be a great model in life. 
and you're always talking to individuals. You don't really talk to collectives ever. Everyone hears, everyone in this room is hearing me through your own individual minds. You're hearing me as an individual and only as an individual and that's it. We don't really speak to whole groups. We don't speak for movements. We only speak for ourselves and we only speak to other individuals. So you have to work on being a good model of human liberty in your own life. That's extremely important. Peer to peer means that you need to, um, work on being a brave and courageous defender of human freedom in your own life as much as possible. Peer to peer. No third parties. Master your material. Don't rely on authorities. Know it really well and be prepared to defend it in every area of life. And if you don't know, say it, you know? If you don't understand something, uh, be honest about it. We're always working peer to peer. The second element of great software uh, protocols is that they these days use cryptography, which I see as being a synonym for intelligence. Cryptography equals intelligence, meaning that we must never stop stuffing our minds full of smart things. I, you know, I feel this way. Um, I like to read something every single day, something big and something powerful and something strong, uh, something uh, vigorous and thrilling. Uh, because it helps me think, and it's, it's what I think is the cryptographic elements of, of the libertarian life. Always becoming smarter and smarter as much as possible, and uh, sharing that information uh, with distinct groups in distinct ways according to your own terms and your own ways. Um, that sounds like a cliche these days, but not so much, because we are all trapped in a world of social media, uh, where we're just watching just massive information flows that are just nonstop. And we very rarely sit down and do disciplined, serious study that informs us in focused ways. Uh, the third thing um, is that great software protocol lives on a distributed network. And we should remember this, that as libertarians, uh, we too live on a distributed network. None of us as individuals is solely responsible for bringing this revolution to a culminating point. We must all depend on each other. And this distributed network is potentially uh, as large as humanity itself. So that doesn't mean that you have to read every single book. Somebody out there is reading the book and they're covering that for you. Find your area of specialization and depend on others to pick up the slack where you can't possibly do this. I, you know, and by the way, this is a... Uh, this is something that many of us who knew Murray had to come to terms with after his death. This was a serious problem because this man was a mighty figure, right? So he could write anything on, you know, the best articles on any subject you could possibly have imagined in like an hour, okay? Like he could read whole libraries in a matter of days. He could crank out books in like a week, okay? This was a man who knew everything and could do everything, and it was terrifying and intimidating after he died because we all wondered, how can we pick up the slack? Uh, he died in 1995. It didn't occur to us at the time that the whole reason God created the internet was because Murray had died. I mean, that was the... <laughs> It took a few years for us to realize this, but um, but you know, uh, you know, we did we didn't we didn't have to be Murray, you know. We we just had to find the thing that we did well. Um, I realized at some point in my life that I would never write human action, and that's okay. Somebody else wrote human action, so I don't have to worry about that, you know. I don't have to write man economy state. Murray already did that, so we just have to find the thing in us that's kind of cool and go with it, because we live as libertarians on a distributed network. Uh, my fourth point is that great, internet pro great software protocol is open source. Now, this is an important point. What I mean by open source is uh, we should not think of ourselves as an esoteric holder of secret doctrines, as a Gnostic sect with private knowledge that we must whisper only to carefully chosen friends, <laughs> right? That's not the way we are. Our message should be open, it should be broad, it should be for the globe. There's no, if, if anything is part of what we believe, we should be willing to say, tell anyone, anytime, anywhere, and not be 
shy about it. If we really believe it, we should just state it. If we're wrong, somebody will tell us, we'll reconsider it later. But let's, let's think of an open source model. Let's don't stand around in dark corners and murmur about all the things we wish we would, could say if only the government and the powers be would let us say it. No, let's just say what we think, live open source lives, let people investigate us, investigate what we believe, share our knowledge with others. We're open source people. The fifth great feature of great distributed, or great um, uh, software is that it's always in the process of development. All great software. Now, this is important. In the early days of software, people would come out with their piece of software. And that was it. They'd come out with our website. Here's our website. That's it. And then like uh, a few months would go by, and you'd suddenly realize, my website's kind of old fashioned. That wasn't supposed to happen. What happened? And I have to, what, update it? I mean, what, what the hell is this? Is this going to go on forever? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Everything must be updated forever. And it took a while for the software world to learn this. Now we have a development process. We have alpha, and we have beta, and we have staging, and we have live. And everything that happens goes through that process. But you know what there's not? There is no final release ever in this world. And nor should we as individual ever find our place when we believe we've been finally released from the obligation to learn and improve and get better and better. And nor is there any final release of this world. Nothing is finally written in stone. Whatever has been written can be unwritten and we can write a new chapter because there is no final release. It's always a process. The things in our heads are alpha. The things we're working on, they're beta. The things we're about to do are staging. The things we're doing are live. But there's always another alpha and a beta and a staging and a live. There's nothing permanent in this world, nothing. And it belongs to the passionate. The future belongs to those who believe in making it wonderful. And I think you are among those people in this room. Thank you so much. for cheering up there a little bit ago. I'm a little bit of a crier, and every once in a while it happens to me. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Who would like to ask a question? I should say thank you so much for taking it up. Uh, yeah, it's really great to be here in Australia. No, it's great to be here. It's really exciting to be here in Australia, right? I mean, this is such a pleasure. Yeah, it's really exciting for me, of course. Yeah, I still can't quite get over it. Tomorrow I get to see the koalas, right? right? By the way, how come Australian beef is better? Is it because the Australian uh, cows have little pockets or something? What, what's the story with that? Oh, uh, the grass? Okay. The answer is Vegemite. Oh, Vegemite. Okay. <laughs> they don't eat sausage rolls. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, we're just briefly get out there. We just wanted to pick up whether it was an accidental bit of the time when you said we give a few people one not be on the use of force. Where did that word get come from? What is it? You said, I'm trying to quote. Give a few people a monopoly. Oh, give. Yeah, no, they don't give. You know, there's a, there's, a great, there's a great debate about the origin of the state. Like, where did this damn thing come from? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, like Albert J. Knox thought it always come, came from conquest. You know, that uh, they we're sort of living a happy life, and then these people just show up and, like, beat us over the head and take over. Um, I, I think it's probably not so much that. I think Hans Hoppe provides a really good account of the origin of the state. What happens is that um, it's what, we, what, ha what ends up happening is that there's an elite group in society that are sort of natural leaders um, that over time come to convince people that they can be trusted with, with an inordinate power over others. And eventually, uh, they, uh, there's, a, there's a period in which uh, they convince uh, because the danger is so, so great to our, to our peace and our prosperity that we have to give them, we grant them a monopoly, um, at least initially as a way of protecting us. And then, and then, then as time passes, uh, nobody remembers a time when it was any other way. Uh, so that's basically his story. Your country, the United States, is a very good example 
but the fact that the majority of people don't do that. Right. The majority of the United States citizens with the right to vote, or it might not be a majority, it's very close to the majority, don't vote at all. The other ones choose a lesser evil. Yeah. So there's no people granted mandate. No, you know what's what's the strangest thing about democracy? I mean, we heard a great talk about democracy yesterday. Were you here for that? It was, it was a great talk. I mean, it's like a relentless 45-minute uh, demonstration of the evils of democracy. I mean, like you're overwhelming. Uh. <laughs> My point is that's because we assume that majority of people are happy with what they've got. Uh, right, but you know what strikes me as strange. The strange thing about democracy is we don't actually vote on issues for the most part. We only vote on on people. Yeah, which is very, very odd if you think about it. Like, I wouldn't mind democracy so much if, the, if it, like, a ballot said, um, uh, should we have a war, yes or no? Um, <laughs> yeah, should we have a police state, you know, that's free to invade your home at any second, yes or no? You know, that's the kind of democracy I think we might turn out pretty well under those conditions. You know, but instead of that, what we have to do is vote for some guy who's like gives you know, bloviating speeches all the time, and then we vote for him and say, oh, "Okay, we trust you. We send him over to Washington, or whatever." And then we have to trust that he does the right thing. You know, which it turns out he doesn't. You know, this is this is the nature of our system. Yeah. I did make a final point. Running out of time. And that is that uh, there's a much simpler explanation of why democracy doesn't work. They're run by governments. Governments rig the elections. Uh, governments do rig elections, yeah. You know, many ways of doing that, but I won't try to explain more now. But there was one I wanted to explain just a few people who time later. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's what's funny. It was you know, um, governments own elections. Uh, this it may be a surprise to you, but um, they governments own the whole system of democracy. <laughs> you know, this is like their little their thing. Uh, we had a strange thing happen in, in the U.S. Uh, very recently, where we had a, a, a libertarian running for for president, and um, and all of his supporters were astonished to discover that the Republicans didn't uh, really want him to be the nominee. And, uh, and they sort of you know, manipulated the system slightly to prevent you know, him from coming anywhere near uh, that position. And they were shocked and horrified. I mean, these libertarians were just amazed to find out that the whole system was just corrupt. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Who could imagine such a thing? Yes. So, in the of a democracy, I'm not an experience, so don't shoot me. Um, instead of a democratic country, what is the better alternative to be? Well, so my ideal is just a country where society rules itself. Uh, that um, law is uh, made of custom and out of the common law and, and the natural practices of people, that it's a court of taste and, and manners and, and conventions, and is mostly dis determined by private enterprise and people's exchange relationships, mostly like you get online today. Uh, so my perspective is that the, the state, the nation state, as emerged in the 16th century is mostly anachronistic in a digital age where we live with global existences and, and, uh, and, and interact one on one with each other. And I think that the social order in a global sense or in a small sense is better able to organize itself than any nation state can organize us. So this is an old fashioned view maybe, maybe it's a hyper digital age view, but it's just generally the perspective that freedom is better than, than any form of, of rule at all. So that's a summary of, I guess you would say, the anarchist point of view. So, so I hope I haven't scandalized you. <laughs> no, I'm not <scared>. Okay. <laughs> all right, that's a great note to finish up. So please, uh, thank you. For your time.